Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really very pleased to be here for this uh, meeting with friends and with all of you to try to address uh, some of the issues that I think could be of interest to all of you, uh, particularly having in mind that a sense of exhaustion haunts the global north, in particular Europe. As we look at the financial crisis, as we look at the economic crisis, energetic crisis, there is a sense of exhaustion. Nothing, no alternative is possible. And all of us that teach students coming from different countries, they, for them, this is a kind of a deja vu. And they really get surprised why Europe, after all, has been exporting all these decisions, all these principles, all of a sudden, cannot apply them to itself. So it looks like that Europe and the global north in general has not much to teach to the world these days. And more tragic than that is that it is incapable from learning from the experience of the world. That is to say, colonialism has disabled Europe from learning from the experience of the, of the world. There's a kind of an inherent, inherent arrogance that planes ever prevents us from learning in active terms from all these other experiences, experiences in the field of human rights, of democracy, of uh, secularism, of spirituality, of other economies, and we feel really this difficulty. So what to do about that? I think we need real and epistemological transformation. We see that the global, there is a global social injustice these days, but we don't think that it can be addressed just by the conventional means, because there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. That is to say, we need an epistemological revolution. And the epistemologists of the South are a way of uh, one path, among many others, through which we can go. How are we going to proceed? Well, in fact, this, we're talking about spaces of transformation. Let's look at uh, cartography. Cartography, as you know, is the technique, modern technique, ancient technique, but in modern times, very elaborate, through which people draw maps. And they draw maps through very specific uh, procedures, three procedures, uh, actually, scales, uh, projections, and symbolizations. That's why we have maps. And these maps, in fact, since modernity, have been fraudulent maps. Uh, Mercator projections, for those that know these things, they are fraudulent. Why? Because the north is not really the north, it's the center. Because the west is not really the west, is the center. And therefore, the south is not really the south, is the periphery. And the east, of course, is not the east, is the periphery. And it is to this manipulation of locations of spaces that, in a sense, we managed to develop a cartography that uh, miniaturizes all the other possibilities coming from outside the west or from outside the north. And therefore, we manipulate the scale in such a way that we naturalize things that, seen from other perspectives, are quite uh, um, absurd. Why the local is less than global? Why the universal is more than the particular? It is not so obvious. Why do we say that some of the universal ideas are European ideas? Well, this is an oxymoron, because if it is European, it's not universal. If it is universal, it is not European. But we have believed that all along. I mean, the School of Frankfurt is just about European universalism. Can we be surprised if uh, 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 an African intellectuals, uh, intellectual calls uh, our European universalism a kind of uh, European tribalism? It could. He could or she could. But in fact, our instruments allow the first, don't allow the last. And that's why I think that at this point, we need an epistemological break. And this epistemological break, we have been calling it the epistemologies of the South. Why the South? The South here is not the geographical South. It's a metaphor for the unjust suffering caused by capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And therefore, there is a South in the North. The undocumented migrant workers are the South inside the Europe. The, the black kids in the District of Columbia or in the District of, uh, of um, in, the, in, in Washington, D.C., they are, of course, the South inside. If we look, for instance, at their life expectancies compared to the life expectancies of the children in Bangladesh, there is a South within the North. 
And this south for us is an anti-imperial south, because there is, of course, also an imperial south. The local elites that in the south benefit from this uh, epistemological injustice that based on the idea that there is one single type of valid knowledge, which is scientific knowledge, which is basically constructed and built around the north, to begin with, critical theory and social theory, you know, it was created at the turn of the century by five authors or in five countries, in Germany, in Italy, in France, in the UK, and a little of it in, in the United States. While the realities of our world today by far exceeds that experience. So what, what we are witnessing is that the world is expanding and Europe is shrinking. And this is a spatial thing. And you have to see new cartographies, new topologies to account for this reality. Because if you don't account for that, then we are going to really uh, remain oblivious of all these different novelties, of these creations, creativities that is taking place around us. And we don't manage to learn from them democratic experiences, experience on other economies, human rights experiences, new constitutionalisms like the constitutionalisms in Ecuador and Bolivia that are discredited very easily around us. So we need an epistemologist that gives credibility to this. And these are the epistemologies of the South, which is really a procedure to inquire into forms of knowledge and validation of knowledges from the perspectives of the people that have suffered in a systematic way the injustices of colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy. It is really from the perspective of suffering, which of course is bodily embodied, as we know suffering is all it is, that we can develop a different alternative, a different uh, epistemological alternative. What are the main characteristics of this alternative in cartographic terms? is that if you look really very, very uh, attentively, in particular starting from this perspective, at maps, for instance, you can see maps are about spaces. But spaces, those are the places. The spaces are dominated by the only sense that modernity has really privileged. That's the sense of vision. Since perspective was developed in painting in the 15th century, it became really the main way of looking at reality and therefore of feeling reality. All the other senses have disappeared. And the space is a way through linear space and linear time, we just see, we don't smell, we don't taste, we don't touch. Places are the sites of resistance in modernity precisely because they are the sites that can be smelled, touched, tasted. And of course, viewed also. So the epistemology here is increasing the capacity of our senses. But in order to do that, cannot really rely on scientific knowledge. Because scientific knowledge is reified on these forms of vision that are very, very much concentrated on vision and leave aside the rest. I even wrote a paper called the Epistemology of Blindness in order to characterize precisely this syndrome. So we need other epistemologies. And these other epistemologies have to start from three basic ideas. The first one is that the experience, that there are many experiences in the world. They are almost infinite, the experiences of the world, in their diversity. And no general theory can account for them. The second one is that the Western, the understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. So there are other understandings of the world. There are other forms of looking at reality of the world, and we should really engage with those. Are we displacing northern epistemologies? Science? Not at all. If I need to go to the moon, of course I need scientific knowledge. But if I need to preserve biodiversity, I need indigenous knowledge. So we need different kinds of knowledges for different purposes. And therefore, it is possible that we, on this basis, create forms of knowledges of what I call the ecology of knowledges. We have to combine different kinds of knowledges because it is really amazing that most people 
in most parts of the world, in most parts of their lives, they go their lives by not resorting to scientific knowledge. They live according to their own knowledges, to their own everyday knowledges, peasants, women, urban dwellers, indigenous people. And all these knowledges are converted into raw material for us in the social sciences. We convert them into raw material. We don't study with them. We study over them. So you need to decolonize our social sciences because then you have, because of this scale that creates the universality as something superior to the, to the particular, we have this uh, very obvious for us, but absolutely absurd when seen from the, the, the side of the entire imperial side, it, south, is that human rights discourse. If you ask today the conventional responses for social emancipation, two concepts come forward, democracy and human rights. There was a time there was socialism, communism, revolution, alienations, class struggle, are gone for the time being. And you have human rights and then democracy. But then we forget that most people are not subjects of human rights. They, don't have sub they are not subjects of human rights. They are objects of human rights discourses by NGOs, by law professors, by law books, but they are objects. The same, they are objects of citizenship. They are not really citizens because they are under the veto power of more, more powerful people. And therefore, they can neither rule nor be ruled, as Aristotle would say, as a definition of the, of, the, of the citizen. So if you look at this, then it is possible to try to develop new cartographies, insurgent cartographies, that are based on the multiplicity of scales, on the multiplicity of projections, on the multiplicity of symbolizations, symbolizations that, for instance, allow that in some society, a river is really a body of water, while in another society, a river is a sacred being. A tree is part of the flora in one society. In other societies, a sacred tree. Should we have the same symbols for the same thing? So we need a plurality of projections, of scales, and this is only possible if we take as our base the place, not the space, but the place. Place that are not bulldozed by the space analysis of cartographies. And these places becomes much richer for our insurgency, for our resistance, because resistance starts from these places, of, of uh, these sites where the place is placed, so to say. And the place above all, the places of all places is the body. Provided that we abandon the stupid relationship between body and soul. Well, the expression is not, it's, it's real radical, but it's not my expression. The expression is by Spinoza. Spinoza said, what, commenting on Descartes, what a stupid distinction between body and soul. Uh, if you really accept Spinoza, then the body is the sight. And that's the place of all places. And that's where we suffer and we also enjoy our lives. La jouissance take place in the body, take place in our society. So if we manage this, we may see that we turn away from catastrophic events as we turn away from glorious victories by looking at the way in which people really try to develop forms of social emancipation. And some of them will call it liberation. Others emancipation, others survival. The name doesn't matter. Since we don't have a general theory, what we need is intercultural translation. When I work with indigenous people in Latin America, they say socialism, but socialism is a, is a, a white man's trap. It has always been there. The socialists have been very racist against the indigenous people. Our model of social transformation is summa causa. It's called buen vivir, vivir bien. That is to say, good life, a life that is prosperity without growth, that does not know property, that considers nature part of society, Mother Earth, that develops in a constitution like the Constitution of Ecuador the rights of nature. 
And when I was there as a consultant to the, this constitution, one of the deputies from the opposition came to me and said, Professor, you are a European process, professor, a very well-learned professor. You know all kinds of theories tell me these Indian people are absolutely stupid, aren't they? To give rights to the nature. How can they give rights to the nature? Nature is an object. And I told him, yes. For your conception of nature, for the concept of nature in which I was trained, this is stupid, it's absurd. But their conception of nature is not this. Their conception of nature is the Mother Earth, is the Pachamama. So different conceptions, we can put that in a kind of a cartography that reduce all these realities into spaces in linearities of time and space. We have to allow for different temporalities. The temporality of a river is different from the temporality of a harvest for a marriage. So you have to account for this diversity and then to see how the places can connect, can interact, can in fact join the conversation. And of course these places can also be in the north. Nobody is trying to get rid of the north. I, I, I usually say in my text that the smallest of the south aim at Aim at disappearing, withering away. There are epistemologists of the South because there are epistemologists of the North, imperial knowledge. And therefore, we should probably struggle for a society in which the North-South divide is not there. But the struggles always start from what we have. And in order to develop a new strategy, we have to start from this. And it is not really to throw Northern uh, epistemologists in the Recycling being of history, not at all. Because the North is not homogeneous. That's the problem of post-colonial studies very often. There is a non-Occidentalist West, which is in fact is the title of one of my articles. How many theories in the West were suppressed because they didn't fit the conquest? You read Pascal is a good example. Montaigne is another example. He was kicked out of the canon of philosophy because, in fact, he dared to think that the, the barbarian indigenous guy from Brazil had a mind and could speak. And he would be, of course, horrified by the bill of by the Pope, Paul III, declaring that the indigenous people had a soul. Of course, they needed that soul. Was this a generous act on the part of the Pope? No. Of course, it was very important to de declare that the indigenous people had a soul in order to evangelize them. Because if they didn't have a soul, they couldn't be evangelized. So it was a very imperial act that goes together with the imperial act of conquest. Anima nullius, terra nullius. These are the forms that the epistemologists of the North, in a sense, develop in a very monolithic way. And I think that the epistemologists of the South are trying to retrieve this experience. They are displacing the North. They are not throwing away the global north, the knowledges, because after all, we are part of that tradition. It is a glorious tradition in many respects, and should be respected in many ways. Freedoms, individualism is important, but not the individual, the entire individualism of neoliberalism. The individualism that, is, that creates powerful individuals on the base of powerful uh, communities. For people that work with indigenous and peasant movements, they know that there are very strong individuals in those movements. But they are born out in the struggle. The knowledge and their subjectivities are born in struggle. So I think that it is precisely at this point that you can develop alternatives that open up the canon at least in three areas. Three areas that I think are very important and we are going to be able, if you try to do to look, in a sense, by displacing the North and force it to enter a conversation as part of a much larger conversation. So science is not wrong because it's science. It's because it claims to be the only legitimate form of, of knowledge. And this happened since the 17th century. The first two victims of science was uh, philosophy and theology. No man, can you, can, you cannot even think of the other forms of knowledge in the parts of the world. So I think that it is this idea of including ecologies of knowledges that is at the core. And for that, we have to perform what I call a sociology of absences. We cannot reduce the reality to what exists because part of the reality is produced as absent, as non-existent. And you have to retrieve that absence 
through new epistemologies. Because if you don't do that, you never see. You never see them. And they remain invisible, as I have called in one of my papers, beyond the line, in the abyssal line, dividing the metropolitan from the, cos from the colonial world. And the metropolitan colonial division is going on in our societies. So these three areas, and I have two minutes for that, and I'll comply exactly with my time, is, is the relationship between individual and the community. It's absolutely important that we raise this issue at a time of crisis, even in the North, in which the entire social uh, individual is so far present. That is to say, this very uh, uh, cruel condition in which we are now. We are talking more and more about the autonomy of the individual. At the same time that you take away from him or her the conditions to be autonomous. They are more and more slaves. They slaves of the work. Stressful work and stressful unemployment. Nobody cares about the amount of money and paid labor that they spend in, search, in searching for labor. So all these are conditions that you wrote the conditions of autonomy. The second one is the nature society binary. Our binaries in the north are all differential, as you can imagine. Can we start thinking that the Mother Earth, nature, is part of ourselves, and the rivers, in a sense, are part of our blood, of our quality of life? Can we really have a different form of development that is not sustainable in the sense that is the conventional sustainability, because that's capitalism, period is sustainable in the sense that our blood is sustained by the purity of the blood of the rivers and of these natures. Can we, on that basis, fight against extractivism that is now destroying Latin America? We have 300 of indigenous people in jail now because they are terrorists. So what they do, they block roads not to allow the mining industries and the timber industries to enter into their territories. So it is the second one, the second challenge, and believe me, if we manage to do that, the conditions for reparations, we can debate, I can explain you in detail what it means, the reparation for uh, contaminating one river under our conceptions and under the conceptions of supercars. The, 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 the calculations are completely different. The third one is the, is the distinction between the secular and the sacred. Something very, very difficult for, for the Western epistemologists but very easy for other epistemologists, which in fact have seen very clearly that in the North, we never really abandoned the sacred. What we did was to secularize the sacred. The nation, the state, are in a sense secularized forms of the sacred. You'll see that very much in the French Revolution with les, les, uh, la nation. So the idea that after all, we are not as secular as you think. And we should not dismiss why the MST, the monument is there, the movement of the landless, before any occupation. They have a movement of prey. They have a movement of joy, of together, giving hands, hugging each other. They call that mystica. It's to create a sense of belongingness that is so intense that cannot be just uh, you know, uh, formulated into any kinds of knowledge is a sentiment that takes a lot of touching, precisely one of our incapacities and one of all the senses in which we are disabled. Thank you so much.